So I wanted to welcome everybody to the, again, the 14th webinar of 2014 entitled Saving the Modern Century, Advocacy and Strategy. We encourage you to become a member of CPF and enjoy the benefits and educational discounts. Information on membership can be found on our website at CaliforniaPreservation.org. The California Preservation Foundation is a membership-based, not-for-profit organization whose mission is to provide statewide leadership in education and advocacy to ensure protection of historic resources in California. The format for today's webinar will consist of one presentation of 60 to 75 minutes. We will close with a 10 to 15 minute question and answer period. There is a Q&A box on the bottom, bottom left hand side of your screen. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, please type it in the Q&A box and we will hold the question until it can be addressed by a speaker. There is also a chat box which is visible to all participants. If you would like to comment or interject, you may do so through the chat box. If you are attached to a microphone, you should grant Adobe Connect voice access to your microphone when asked to do so. Your voice will be muted during most of the presentation, but you may raise your hand by clicking on the hand symbol at the top of your screen. Once your hand is raised, we will grant you voice access at an appropriate time in the presentation. This will allow you to have a short dialogue with the speakers or ask a question in person. If for some reason your sound does not work, you will need to type in your question or response in the chat box. I'm now going to introduce today's speaker. Christine Madrid French, architectural historian, was born and raised in Los Angeles. She graduated from the University of Utah in Architectural Studies in 1992 and worked for the National Park Service as an historian in Washington, D.C. Ms. French earned a master's degree in architectural history from the University of Virginia in 1998. She is also a writer and photographer, with her work appearing in U.S. News and World Report, Virginia Living, Modernism Magazine, and Landscape Architecture. In 2000, she co-founded the recent Past Preservation Network and served as the president for nine years. She then worked as the director of the Modernism and Recent Past Program for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, a two-year project funded by the Henry Luce Foundation through 2011. She taught archi architectural history at the University of Central Florida and is an expert member on the 20th Century Heritage Committee for the International Council of Monuments and Sites. French is now serving as a curator of history at the Art and History Museums, Maitland in Central F Florida, and as a project director for Preservation Capon, the landmark effort to save an 1885 house by cutting it in two and floating it across a lake to the grounds of the Alban Polisek Museum and Sculpture Gardens. The house is now being restored on its new site. So without further ado, I'm going to, introdu uh, to um, introduce Christine, but first I would uh, need to mute everybody that's currently unmuted. I have a lot of things to go over, and I want to, it's a little harder for me to do webinars. I usually like to talk to everybody a little bit before I get started. So I did put in the chat box, if you have any comments, uh, you can feel free to do that. So I have a couple of screens open and I can and figure all that out. But uh, this is Saving the Modern Century, Advocacy and Strategy. And I know you in the, uh, in the Pacific region, you're sort of missing your lunch right now. So here is a picture to inspire you. Uh, this is Charles, you know, if your architectural style is mid-century modern, or even if it's not, you will definitely get something out of this talk to help you with your advocacy. So my history in architecture, uh, as John mentioned, I did work with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I was the director of the Modernism Program for two years. And I helped save uh, buildings like this one. This is uh, Minoru Yamasaki's 1966 Century Plaza Hotel that was actually endangered. A developer wanted to demolish it and build two skyscrapers. Now the skyscrapers are going off in the back of that building. And even though I have a lot of wins, I also have many uh, notable losses. And if any of my friends are on the phone, you know that I was involved with this effort to save Neutra's cyclorama at Gettysburg for more than 14 years. And eventually this is how it ended up, uh, even though we did win a federal lawsuit against the National Park Service to save the building it still didn't stop the demolition. So there are a lot of challenges. And for a little while, I actually gave up, <laughs> after the cyclorama, I actually gave up on preservation. I said, forget this. It's too, uh, it's too hard. I don't want to do it anymore. 
but you know how that is. I got sucked back in, and my latest project is uh, saving the Cape and House in 1885 Victorian. Uh, we did cut it in half. We side weighed 100 tons, and we floated it across the lake here in Florida and are putting it back together now at a museum. So this lecture is going to be focusing on a couple of things. There's some key issues that I think are preventing some of our some of the wins that we could have in modernism. And there's also some myth busting in this in this presentation where we are actually kind of our own worst enemies when we're looking at modernism. So essentially the whole thing is about changing the way that we think about historic architecture and historic preservation in the 21st century. And uh, these are the learning objectives that we are going to cover uh, that the California Preservation Foundation has set for this program. And we will identify the key features of a successful advocacy effort. We will go over strategies for mobilizing support and increasing awareness. Um, how to engage with audiences to strengthen advocacy efforts is critical. And also identify unique problems, and especially the opportunities. Because if you're looking at modernism, there will be some areas that you can excel in. And I'll show you some of them. So the four words I want everyone to remember, if, even if you get distracted, is that preservation is good business. A lot of people that I talk to, you know, they'll laugh. The, the developer uh, putting up his $2 billion project, he said, that's ridiculous. It's not. It doesn't count. But it actually is good business. And we need to remember that everything that we do, we need to promote this in the end. It is about history. It's about people. It's about building. But it is a good business. And that covers a lot of the areas uh, where you can get more favorable reception. Um, I did travel across the country and talked about modernism. And when I was with the National Trust, we had modern modules which is one way to really get the outreach out there. We'd have a public presentation with a panel discussion, and then that was followed by um, more of a, a specific arena where we would have the preservation leaders and civic leaders all come to, around the table and talk about how are we going to solve these modern issues. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about me, because I think key to understanding modernism is understanding people who love modernism. And as you know, if you've tried to save a modern building, not everybody loves modernism. It's definitely something either, it's like cilantro, I guess. Either you love it or you don't. But what I discovered about myself is that uh, what was the big influence was that I was raised in Los Angeles. So I was. Um, Born there in the 60s, everything that I experienced as a child was modern. So we would go to Bob's Big Boy like this for our snacks after school. Uh, we'd go to downtown LA, Capitol Records. A lot of the uh, buildings that I actually want to save end up being built in the same year I was born, 1966. Uh, the city hall was modern. My bank in my hometown of Glendale was designed by Sarmiento who designed skyscrapers, small skyscrapers across the country uh, for banks. And this is a picture of my mom that I found standing in front of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. And when I saw that, everything made sense to me why modern, particularly, uh, is the type of design that makes me want to go to the mat to fight and save a building. So uh, now I'm in Orlando. And so after I got here to Orlando, I moved here about three or four years ago, uh, which is actually very similar to Los Angeles in some ways. Uh, after I got here, though, I met some very interesting people, and they were called the Futurists. And they actually work at Disney. They work with Imagineers. And the Futurists were uh, at a preservation conference uh, that the University of Florida hosted. And this is what the Futurists would say. And they stumped a whole bunch of us by saying, if we don't imagine our future, somebody else will imagine that future for us. In this case, it usually ends up like this. So this future is asked all of, our, uh, all of the preservationists in the room, what is your future in preservation? What are you going to do in, in 20 years, 30 years? How do you see it? And this is, this is what we said. 
you know, complete makes sense, which was amazing. All of us were speechless because we had spent so much time always thinking about the past. I spent all my time in the 1880s, the 1950s, the 1960s. I never thought about 2030, 2040, 2060. And so when that came up, it really made me think of some of these new approaches, how we can save modernism, but also start going forward and thinking about the challenges that we're going to face when the 1970s become 50 years old, 80s, 50 years old, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the first things I wanted everyone to, to really absorb is that the outreach, at least in my approach, is the key. It's always about outreach, constantly. And you're either writing, you're doing social media, you're presenting papers, you're talking to people, or you're having lunch, you go to parties, whatever it is. And then when you're doing that outreach, you have to be sure to use the right language for each group that you're trying to get support from. So if I'm trying to get money, I have a pitch. If I'm talking to people who just love architecture and modernism, I have a different pitch. So the return on investment set is harder, so you have to have another pitch for them. The green, sustainability, that's a whole other set. Urban livability. Heritage conservation, architectural savvy audiences are probably the easiest because you can cut right to why a building is important. And then the governmental organizations and entities really require that you write and speak about historic architecture in a very specific way. And if you don't know how to do that and you need to fill out something for the government, then you should hire somebody who actually writes sort of that government type of speak, because you will be more successful. So uh, central to all of that is reframing this question, because I think we are creating these arbitrary uh, boxes where we sh we're trying to put everybody in the box. Here's the Art Deco people. Here's the modernists. You know, here's the Victorian. Here's the roadside. Here's the Lustron people. So it's not about why saving modernism is important, but why is it the bigger question? Why is saving historic 20th century buildings important? So we expand the context. It's not just about the 50s or the 60s. It's about the whole 20th century at this point, which, by the way, we are quickly moving in the past uh, at 2014 already. So this is what's at stake as we think about what, how do we go in the future with preservation. There's a lot at stake. So if we go up to like 2066, and um, which is when the uh, National Historic Preservation Act would be uh, 100 years old, we will actually have lost entire categories of 20th century building type because we sort of just weren't paying attention until it was too late. So you know, with, uh, I'll show you some of these. Here's a, a motel, right? I drove across the country twice. Uh, one was, I think, in 88, one was in 92. And um, when I did that, you could still take the back roads. You could still see these old motels, a lot of the old American roadside. It was still there. And then if you go across the country now, I would estimate geez, at least 50% of the buildings that I stopped at are probably demolished by now, and it could be even higher. These small motels are very difficult to save, and they're very easy to tear down. And they were never constructed to last 100 years, uh, you know, 150 years, anything like that. Uh, the indoor mall. So people laugh at a lot of my um, ideas, but the indoor mall, it will indeed be extinct at some point because, you know, it took over. Everybody had their indoor mall, indoor mall and now they're actually being demolished. So the cycle continues. Um, the other one that I showed first was the drive-in. So there used to be, I think at the peak in the 70s, I believe there were 4,200 drive-ins at one time. And now in the entire country, there are, I think, less than 500 functioning drive-ins. So you can go from a huge number and then all the way down. So we have 2,500 restaurant houses that uh, were constructed and, and actually built. And every time we lose one, it's just a diminishing number of resources. We can never rebuild a, a historic restaurant at this point. So this is part of the challenge. So here we are, 2014, and everything 1964 and, 
and forward or back is considered historic, which we will talk about that 50-year guideline. Uh, if you go forward again, 2025, 1975 is your 50-year goal, which makes this um, guideline not that useful uh, sometimes for us working on recent past architecture. Something that was uh, amazing to me when the futurists talked about it, that we're actually a lot closer to 2050 than we are to 1950. So I keep going back to that theme, but we really need to massage this idea of what time is and how old these buildings are. We're not. Uh, so if you think about historic preservation in 52 years, you know, Frank Gehry's work will be uh, 50 years old, and this is going to be something, when I see his work go up, I'm like, how the heck am I going to save that? Because it probably has a leaky roof, and I'm sure all the windows will have a problem. But this is exactly what we face uh, today. Uh, the other challenge that we are facing is that we keep building huge numbers of structures. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, demolishing huge numbers. So the EPA estimated that uh, there's 103 million tons of waste per year. <coughs> Excuse me. And that we're just going to keep building and building. So our historic architecture just keeps ending up in the trash. <clears throat> um, aging critical facilities. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a cold. <clears throat> aging critical facilities is something else that um, a lot of preservationists have not <clears throat> addressed. Uh, this is sort of that concept where <clears throat> you buy all of your clothes at one time. So I buy my dress, my shoes, everything in 1985 or something. Well, in a year or so, I have to replace everything. So during the 50s and uh, after World War II, the United States had such a huge uh, program of construction, and all of these buildings are aging out at the exact same moment. So this is a post office in Miller Park that's hanging on, but most people don't like it. Um, all of our hospitals, where I grew up in Glendale, all the hospitals, the police stations, the city hall, all built at the same time. These are buildings that have to work for the public. It's a very difficult project to save an old fire station, for instance, where the, uh, the fire trucks don't fit in the front door anymore. This is going to be a continuing challenge. Uh, our own biases impact our success in preservation projects. So when you're talking about a building, I want you to try to pause before you say anything and think about how your own personal bias, biases are going to impact your success. Uh, the first thing I would say is we have to banish this term, architectural eyesore. Um, people use it. People will use it against you. It's a two-word, uh, sort of a key phrase that like a developer or somebody will use against you if you're trying to save a building. And the developer, whoever it is, could just say, that building is an architectural eyesore, or it's just an eyesore. That's all they have to say. Everyone's like, well, oh, he's right, or she's right. That's it. I'm not going to do it. In the meantime, you have to come up with your argument, why it's important, who designed it, you know, why we should save it, what is your return on investment. Well, people don't have time to get through all that. So we ourselves should actually stop using this term when we talk about architecture, because it comes right back in the press or whichever and then bites you when you're trying to save a different type of building. Uh, this is a photo of courtesy Jean Landon. She worked for the National Trust for a while. Uh, it's made Vandero uh, in Chicago. And um, I believe that Chicago. Uh, modernism should be demolished. A lot of people say that to me, at least when we first started these uh, projects in the 90s. I said it should be demolished. It was a mistake in which this shouldn't be here anyway. So we're just going to keep going and tear everything down. And that people still say this today. This was a uh, headline in the New York Times, which is, are some buildings too ugly to survive? And with that, showing a picture of Paul Rudolph 
Orange County Government Center, 1963 um, construction. It was uh, going to be demolished. It was definitely in danger. And advocates have a bit tenuous. I mean, there have to be a lot of changes. It has some ridiculous number of roofs. Each one of those little projections has its own roof. And for a government center, I don't know if they have the resources you need to take care of a building this complicated. The last thing that we set up for ourselves um, is we create these arbitrary arguments, and then we all get caught up in them, and the public really doesn't care what the result is, but we end up uh, breaking up into factions within the historic preservation community, which doesn't really help us get ahead in the least bit. Um, this is one of the most I guess you'd say famous arguments between two preservationists, uh, you know, is the McDonald's uh, more important than Mount Vernon? And they said, yes, it is. And I'm not sure I can argue either direction because I you can say McDonald's had a pretty uh, significant impact on 20th century architecture, culture, and Washington is equally important or more important, but it's not about that. It's not saying well, if we just say this McDonald's, then we care about Mount Vernon. That's not at all how it, how it works. But then the public starts thinking it. And they say, oh, I heard that someone said this, and it's, and it's um, I see some of this in the chat. Um, it's just something we should avoid. I don't think it gets us ahead at all. It doesn't make it complicated. Um, and then the last thing here is that we should probably admit that people actually really enjoy uh, demolishing things and then building them up again. So this is a picture from, I think it's the 1920s, uh, when they're demolishing up a field to put up a public housing project. And um, and this is someone obviously taking you know a massive amount of enjoyment in destroying the cornerstone of Evans Field from 1912. And you'll see it again and again. So they make a big deal about it. We're going to implode something, and everyone turns out, and they just they actually really enjoy demolition. So we have to acknowledge that and sort of build that into the arguments that we are are working on uh, to attract the public. Uh, here's a excuse me. Here's something that we have to remind people is to create the context that modernism was or is American architecture at mid-century. There, there was a lot of other things, wagon wheel, um, you know, neo-colonial. But across the country, if we take a scope, you know, from the, you know, 1945 through 1970 or 1975, it was just really all modern. Everything that was very significant in my mind uh, that was built during that period was modern. This is an image that an architect put together for me, which I actually use in a lot of my public outreach. Uh, it is, I think, critically important to be a uh, developed partnership with architects uh, who can visually convey the points that you're trying to make. Because I'm a historian, I can come up with you know a 50-page paper on why a building is important, and, but it's harder to have something like this, an image that just immediately says, this is why something is important. In this image, he shows buildings all from the same period, including uh, two noise structures. Uh, we see we have a Paul Rudolph in here, um, a Jim Owings and Merrill, and uh, I am Pei, I believe. A lot of these have already been demolished. Each time we lose one of these buildings, we are losing this uh, historic context of American architecture during that period. This is a building in Hawaii, so you'll find modernism everywhere you go, as you know if you are a fan of modern. This is Minnesota, <clears throat> and this one is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. People have experienced with modernism either in the school, in the, in the courthouse, in the skyscraper, in the restaurant, uh, and people actually will stand up for modernism. This is an image um, from the Phyllis Wheatley School. A preservation effort. It was built in 1955, and I love this um, particular image because it has the old-style preservationists holding hands around the building to stop the bulldozers. 
and said it was an old Victorian back there. It's a beautiful modern structure. Uh, this building did end up getting demolished. So this is a, an easy way. So you don't ever want to say, is it old? You just want to say, is it historic? And the one thing I think that conveys this uh, the most quickly is the uh, presidential uh, birth, it's not the birthplace, but the childhood home of President Obama. It is not an old building. It is in Honolulu. And it's, uh, it's very important, obviously, it's what is now enters the collection of presidential homes, childhood homes. Uh, but it's just a condo in this structure. So here's the challenge. You know, we have we have our Mount Vernon, and then we have President Obama's condo. This building is not old, but it is historic. So that is something that you can use. Uh, if people are like, well, those buildings aren't old. I remember when they were built. And I'm sure everyone on this phone has heard that before. But it's not about that. It's about does the building have historic significance to the community? Uh, that brings us to the 50 years old concept, <clears throat> which is very problematic. It's been, uh, some people interpret it very strictly, some people very loosely. A lot of communities have actually tossed it entirely. It still is the guiding standard for the National Register and for other federal government programs. Uh, but if we look at it, we can see how over the, uh, I think it was, 1966, they really had the National Register um, what started under the National Historic Preservation Act. So it's almost 50 years old itself. And we can see that it's really created an imbalance in how things have been recognized. So even if something is older than 50 at this point, it should be anything before 1964, it should be, re it should be designated, it should be recognized. But what happens, and you can see from this, is that in San Francisco, which has a beautiful collection of post-World War II architecture, um, only 0.01% uh, of the 265 locally designated listings are built after 1945. So that means that your pure root building is not protected uh, locally. And I've actually met preservationists who said, they would never defend that building because they saw it as construction. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places in San Francisco, very similar, 0.05% of the 173 places in San Francisco that are listed are after 1945. So this period between 45 and 64 at this point is basically undocumented in terms of the National Register. And this is also what happens, you'll see a huge concentration for places maybe like California, where you have a much better system of recording and documenting, and a lot less in places like Nevada and in Arizona, where you can see that says there are no properties at all on the National Register in a number of counties. So it's a very uneven distribution of how the register is portraying what's important in American architecture. Uh, this is just going towards the challenge that we face. So, you know, a lot of us, when we started in the 90s to save modern, people said, oh, this is so hard, saving stuff from the 50s. And then we got to the 1960s, and we're like, wow, that was really difficult. And if we look ahead a little bit, you can see in the 70s, uh, there are actually uh, more buildings were constructed in the 70s than were, ever, than were constructed in the previous decade. And so it's just going to keep growing and growing the challenge for preservation. So um, we do need to embrace multiple perspectives of the future success of preservation. And this includes uh, economic, uh, historic, generational, and contextual arguments, where we can present these things in different contexts depending on who you're talking to, which is what I had referred to earlier. A lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm, all, I'm very open to saving you know, different, all kinds of things with all of these contexts. <clears throat> and then I ask people, well, how would you save one of these sort of McMansions, that people call a McMansion, uh, from a subdivision from the 80s? You know, how would you do that? And then they're like, well, I would never try to save an 80s subdivision 
But the problem with that is that somebody will come along eventually and they will say, I really want to save this 1980 subdivision and we have spent the last 20 years being close to that idea and we start this whole cycle again where we have preservationists really trying to fight to get to the top of this idea and this understanding of architecture having significance outside of this age concept and really outside of the beauty concept as well. So in terms of modernism, we know that modernism sells. And so we're looking at the economic argument for modernism. And there's a lot there that we really need to take advantage of it a little more. We know modernism sells. So uh, you know it's very popular right now on TV, in style. So there are some uh, places that are taking advantage of this, and they've been doing it before it became popular in Hollywood. Um, this is Modernism Week in Palm Springs. Uh, they have this every, it's actually 11 day event. It's been going for 10 years now, and this is a sample of some of the architecture that you'll see there. Uh, one of those buildings is a Neutra building. And the red, we have some roadside, we have Lautner, they have a big collection. When I was with the National Trust, we uh, helped to fund, <laughs> through a grant, a post visitor survey post-experience visitor survey. So because they had, Palm Springs was still losing historic buildings, even though they had been engaging in public outreach for 10 years. So then we said we need an economic argument for the city council. And they can see that if they lose the buildings, then these people will stop coming to Palm Springs. So we did some attendance numbers. And you can see how they grew. And these are now four years old. And the event has continued to expand. So even more than the numbers is what does that really mean? So we use these economic impact calculators, and we could find that in 2009 it was about a $2 million impact, and only one year later it was a $4 million, almost $5 million impact for Palm Springs. This is an argument you can use for your ROI um, uh, people who are interested, like what are we getting back by saving these structures? This is part of Palm Springs at home tour parties, of course, modernist love parties. By the way, if you are trying to attract modernists uh, to your organization, you should have a home tour with a party afterwards, and they will come out of the word work. Um, I am actually going to be speaking at this event, Sarasota Modern Weekend. Sarasota is in Florida. It's sort of a sister city to Palm Springs architecturally. Uh, Paul Rudolph lived in Sarasota for many years and developed actually not his concrete, um, but he worked in glass and steel. This was in his earlier period. And so uh, Sarasota started their own weekend event because they have a distinct problem. They keep losing all of these buildings. It's really uh, inexplicable because they have a beautiful, unique connection, a uh, collection of modern buildings. You'll see the same thing. <clears throat> you see the same thing, Modern Phoenix. Um, it's a wonderful event, very well attended. And then this one is uh, Tucson, started a Modernism Week. This was created by Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation. It's a multi-day series of events, lectures, parties, films. Uh, 2,000 people took part in 2012. And then even just one year later, more than 3,500 people joined these events. It's really critical if you're doing a modern event that you get people who talk modern. So it's just like if I had an event for people who love Victorian buildings, it's going to be a completely different approach than I would use to attract people who like buildings from the 1970s. You need to make sure that you uh, customize whatever it is you're doing. It, it is really all about that big context of architecture, but when you're aiming for a very specific audience, like that, the architectural South Gabby audience need to know that language. Uh, this is another thing. So Demian Klinko, he's advisor to the National Trust. He wrote a blog for the National Trust, and he says that you have to make modern relevant, accessible, and sexy, which is the way it does stand out from other periods of architecture. I mean, it was supposed to be very bold. It was supposed to be stand out. And it was uh, something that you can uh, play on that messaging. 
making sure the messaging is key, and framing that message with photography and graphics is part of it. Um, I also uh, just did a lecture in Palm Springs. It was a tilt from America's Mid Century Closet, Hidden Stories of Modernism, and it, and it was also about sex and race and modernism. So it's exploring its alternative histories of modern architecture from that period in order to draw a different audience uh, in terms of our public outreach. So when you're, you want to try to build this movement, this is from Damien's uh, recommendation. It's about celebrating, too. This is when these events actually succeed more than others. Uh, preservationists like myself are often frequently very sad because we lose so many of these buildings. You can't forget to celebrate. That attracts new people. Uh, and then we develop partnerships with architects, business people, uh, civic leaders. And we have to educate property owners, which I will have a little um, example here in a second. <clears throat> so there's a lot of diverse stories in, in the modern, if you think of modern slash recent past, recent past is anything built within the last 50 years. It is a moving window, as I talked about. And so we keep going forward and forward, and you, and you never um, quite hit the end of the challenge. So the key really is to do your research. Uh, you might not know something that's historic when you look at it. I'm sure a lot of us know this already, but other people do not. They'll see something, they hate it, they're like that can't possibly be significant, and they don't. Uh, and they could lose something really important. When I'm presenting my research, I try to remember that people actually don't connect just to the building. They connect to the people and the history of the building. So if I'm talking about Neutra, I can't just talk about Richard Neutra and his you know, artistry with steel and glass that doesn't really penetrate the public mind. It has to be about who lives in the building, who constructed the building, how does that building impact the community? That's the kind of thing that works. <clears throat> a part of that is showing your own perspective. So when I started uh, with the Gettysburg Cyclorama project, uh, this is what the building looked like. This is probably 1998. Very dirty, uh, much, very much in disrepair. Part of the campaign, basic campaign to discredit the architecture, of course, is to stop maintenance. So that's what they saw, and but this is what I saw because I knew the history and I knew the building was important and I know it had a significant part of the park. Um, other buildings that could be surprised. Uh, this is Space Mountain at Walt Disney World. It's actually the oldest operating roller coaster in Florida. Opened in 1975. Uh, this Zephyr Surf Shop in Santa Monica it was landmarked in 2007. It's considered the birthplace of modern skateboarding. So you can approach your different audiences by looking at different types of architecture and the significance of the background. And this is Sedgwick Avenue, uh, which is considered the birthplace of hip hop. And it is, I believe, a National Historic Landmark. <clears throat> this one, uh, if anyone's in California, they might know this building, but I can usually get, if I'm in, uh, I'm in Kansas. Nobody knew what it was. This is a ranch house. And I say, why would you think that this building is important? But thousands of people consider this the site of pilgrimage. And really, uh, it's a building I believe is protected. And it is, of course, the home to um, Apple computers. Uh, Jaws and my network connectivity was lost, it says. You want me to keep going? If you can continue, I can uh, advance the slides for you if you'd like. OK. All right. Um, oh, I got it back. All right. So uh, here we are, Apple computer. OK. So this is a key, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes on this little concept, which is don't forget to tell the owners that the building is significant, which I think is the first error that we all make. I studied a lot of buildings, uh, getting my master's, and then I realized that the owners of the building that was in the book didn't even know their building was important. Here's an example of how you can do this. Uh, this is Jackson Fly Elementary School in Charlottesville, Virginia. And it's very modern. And if you've been to Virginia, this is not really what Virginia thinks of as their 
architecture. Uh, this is more like it. So this is Jefferson um, University of Virginia, Charlottesville. You know, the brick and the columns is much more what people are expecting, not this kind of you know, uh, eye beams and such. But I knew that it was based on this idea uh, proposed by Mean van der Rohe. Uh, here was Crown Hall, this simplification. And it had some kind of a, a deeper meaning. And I was like, why would you build a modern school in Charlottesville? in basically the shadow of Jefferson's uh, own home and school. And what I found out was actually that modernism, in this case, was used intentionally as a way to shed all of the past. There was nothing on the building that would bring you back to the past. And the reason <coughs> is that in Virginia, they had a very contentious history about um, integrating the school. In fact, the governor in 1958 closed all of the schools in Charlottesville, Norfolk, and Arlington to avoid integration. And 13,000 students uh, were thrown out of school. So um, African-American students had to attend school in barns and garages and basements. And finally, when uh, this was, which was ended in 1959, people said, we need new schools that we can work with with all of these students together. And the old idea of the brick and the columns was something they wanted to avoid. The principle that we want to have an open plan school where everybody is working together. And the students can all co-mingle. Well, with Jackson Via, what I then discovered by doing the research, as I mentioned, is that it was actually named for two women, one white and one African American, who, who were teachers who worked with all of the children. And then also that this school was considered uh, one of the top schools when it was built. It was built, it's uh, designed by Caldwell Willis Scott, and they designed a lot of schools around the country. You might have one in your own community. So, but the school didn't know this. The school actually did not like the building at all by this time. So it's, you know, the 40-year-old open plan school. They said it doesn't work. Nobody can find the entrance. We don't understand it. And so what I did was I put together this little poster, and I gave it to the, I printed it out, you know, at Staples or something, 16 by 20, uh, laminated. I gave it to the principal, and she put it in the front hallway of the school. And for me, it was a big, it felt like a victory, because at least I could make the first step to getting the people to understand why this particular building was important in that community. It's all very colorful and hopefully easy to read if you didn't have a lot of time. So uh, we need to make wiser choices for preservation. And that would be, as we go into the end here, this uh, regeneration. Uh, preservationists, I think, might want to try to be a little more flexible about buildings. There are some buildings that have absolutely no change whatsoever, and that's fine. Um, you know, that could be a Mies van der Rohe or it could be the Philip Johnson's glass house. Obviously, you want those to have no changes whatsoever. But if you're talking just Main Street, uh, USA, you might get further ahead in your uh, preservation if you accept some of these adaptations. You preserve the original character and intent, and you celebrate the history, and you uh, adapt the structure. So there's this Apollo 13-inspired tip, which is focused on how something can work rather than how it won't. So, so many people say, well, that building is just never going to work for me. I see this particular house is, I can't possibly do it. I must tear it down and build a brand new structure. How can that building work for the owner instead of how it does it not? Um, Christy McClear had talked about the Generation Gen 2 preservation movement, which is upcoming and is still it's it's really beginning to gain strength. And this would be about another part of this adaptation. When I first heard of the High Line, that somebody was going to preserve the High Line and make a big park out of it and had no money, I thought they are never going to succeed. Uh, but they did in, 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 in a huge way. It actually cost $200 million. Uh, The High Line, is, if you don't know, it's an old railroad track that goes through uh, New York. You can see on the right-hand side, it just goes right between these buildings. 
Everyone's like, we've got to get rid of this. It's a remnant of the past. There's nothing we can do with it. But other people said, wait, this is going to be a beautiful elevated park. Of course, nothing ever was like even me, but that's crazy. Um, it cost $200 million to restore it. But what happened is it generated $2 billion in all of these buildings and changes to it and in new construction to uh, the people that wanted to be next to this amazing park. <clears throat> Apprentice uh, is by Bertrand Goldberg. This is Apprentice Women's Hospital. It is being demolished or it is already gone. It was a huge effort to save this uh, structure. And I think every type of approach that I've talked about was tried. And in the end, it was really up to the mayor of Chicago who would not uh, go with the preservation plan. But interestingly, uh, something that was proposed was uh, this idea by Jane Gang, uh, which would be to uh, put an entire skyscraper on top of the building. Uh, many of us were horrified <laughs> when we first saw this. So like, how could you do that to that beautiful structure? But then I thought about it some more, and I thought, well, why shouldn't we do that? If this saves the building, maybe that's the option. But it, even that, even that wasn't a component. This is in that generation two preservation movement. While students here at the University of Utah, in their brutalist structure, uh, themselves initiated a net zero rehab, where the building actually uh, supports itself uh, through uh, green sustainability techniques, by you know water <coughs> and electricity. They did receive a grant to do this, and so this building was saved. Uh, this is actually where I, this is the College of Architecture I attended in this building when I went to University of Utah. And for Cyclorama, we had a lot of interesting, innovative ideas. Uh, these, this is a diagram constructed by Jason Hart in his term Cube Work. Uh, Cyclorama is Richard Neutra, 1961, very important building. It was part of a Mission 66 program. Uh, to develop the parks in the mid-century. That's irreplaceable. Obviously, most buildings, we only have a diminishing number. Uh, what we did was uh, prepare a whole set of plans for the park service, showing how this building could be, in effect, disassembled and portions of it saved and moved off of the battlefield where it was at Gettysburg and moved across the street. Uh, we had business owners who said they would take it. The plan never. Uh, quite reached the point it needed to. But this is a rendering of the, of the um, rotunda portion of the building moved across the street and hooked up to the museum that was there. And then the inside of uh, being reworked with some of the uh, interior structure exposed so people could see more of it, and then used for the electric map, which I think is now in storage. Uh, here's another one with architects. So I think this is very important to have these collaborations. And um, this is modern St. Louis, and it's the Lewis and Clark Library, which is very close to not making it. And they've prepared. I mean, we're doing this work for people who should know better and who should be doing it themselves. That is true. But in preservation, as you know, you sometimes have to uh, be proactive with these design efforts to show people that they can't see it. People cannot visualize these old buildings in a new context. So uh, here, modern St. Louis has, has a whole plan with the building being reused and on site and construction of a new structure while still keeping the original. This is not really um, rocket science, but for some reason, uh, cities just um, seem to understand that you can keep your building or scoot your building over or move it or sad and build next to it. Not everything has to be demolished to accommodate these new uses. So um, what we should talk about real quick is brutalism. Um, I wanted to mention, too, that though I did not specifically talk about landscape architecture or just structures like bridges and roads and other things, the same concepts apply. Uh, and with landscape architecture, to me it was a little bit like learning about brutalism. I really did not understand what made a landscape significant. I said, I need to know this. So I had a number of my friends in landscape architecture show me different um, different places, explain it, explain why it's important. 
and I had to do the same thing actually about brutalism because um, this is in Orlando. This is a everyday occurrence around here. Um, Orlando Public Library. It is actually um, a 19 a 1966 all concrete brutalist structure. Um, this is what people think of when they look at it. They think it's just the best star there, but there's a whole contingent of people that love brutalism, and they're actually very excited about preservation. That's the kind of reaction we want to tap into to get support. So this is that Orange County Government Center. This brutalism is beautiful. This is Arkinex has this I Heart Brutalism t-shirt that they sell. And there's even a whole movement in Boston called Heroic Concrete, which is run by three architects, where they just they said, we're going to do our own style of advocacy for brutalism. And uh, I had to have people take me around and explain brutalism to me, too. But once I got it, then I really understood. And now I've really become an advocate for saving these buildings. Here's a honeymoon photo that I found online with that Orlando Public Library. Again, so people do like this architecture. We need to remember that when we're doing our outreach. Um, I'm going to wind it up here in the next five minutes. So this is a quote from Michael Allen, Modern St. Louis. He has a blog that I recommend that people, uh, if you Google him, uh, you'll find it. Uh, he says, demolition should be a last option and not a first response. If we're thinking about that, we need to remember excuse me, to not be afraid to propose these drastic measures to save buildings. I know that. Um, for a long time, I would work with people and say, we can't move the building. It loses its original context. And I understand that intellectually. But intellectually, we are going to lose these buildings. They will end up in the dumpster if we don't move some of them. We've been doing this for centuries, actually, moving buildings out of the way. This is a photo, um, 1966, about the time I was born in Los Angeles. They're moving all the Victorians out of the way when they were um, rebuilding, I think this is Bunker Hill, but there's that Dorothy Channel with the billions in the back. So some of these drastic measures, um, this would be, you know, starting a campaign to save a structure that nobody likes and hardly anyone remembers when the old post office pavilion was going to be torn down in 1970. And the Don't Tear It Down was a very early preservation effort. Very, you know, and that's a good one to study if you want to see old style preservation <clears throat> with outreach and advocacy. Of course, now you would think, of course, we won't tear something like that down. But buildings like this are still being demolished across the country. This one was saved with a huge community effort. Um, of course, Miami, Miami Beach, which was almost totally demolished by a huge um, urban redevelopment plan in the 70s. And one woman put together the entire effort, had got the community involved. It was uh, Barbara Chapman, and she saved these structures. And of course, they generate a huge amount of money. And this is the one I'm working on now, which is the Cape and House, this 1885 house. Uh, it's the same situation as, as I would find even in a modern building. The new owners bought it, and they said it's too small. It wasn't going to fit their needs. They paid $2 million for the lot, um, and they said, we're going to tear this building down. It belonged to a founder of the city, Winter, the city of Winter Park here. And so um, one of our contractors proposed this completely outrageous idea of chopping the house in half and floating it across the lake to a museum. Uh, it couldn't go by road because there were too many big trees in the way. Uh, so it was move it by lake or, or, or lose it. And we did end up raising uh, $450,000 in less than six months to move this house. We did indeed chop it in half. And here's a picture of it floating. It was pretty momentous. It was really uh, inspiring to see this happen. You see the whole community get behind the preservation effort. And it, and it helped me get back into, this, into historic preservation after losing um, the Gettysburg Psychorama. And so these are just some words to think about. Uh, and then I can 
take any questions. So if you want to put something to talk, or we can go back and look at some of these slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, we are now going to open it up to questions. And uh, just to repeat what I said earlier, um, in order to unmute yourself if you're on a phone, uh, all you would do is press star six if you'd like to ask a question. You can also raise your hand, um, and that alerts us, lets us know that you have a question. Or you can just type a question in the chat box. Um, so while we're sort of waiting for questions, um, Christine, I was hoping uh, you could talk more about the Gen, Gen 2 preservation movement, which I had uh, no idea mm -hmm. of and I didn't know anything about. Uh, sure. I mean, that I think Christy just hit upon a way that we can refer to it. I think it's been going on for a while. I think it's taking a, maybe a more innovative approach to preservation. And, and I think we actually are required to do that because the types of buildings that we are trying, buildings, landscapes, structures that we are trying to save are actually so much different than uh, what you might have saved or our predecessors would have saved in like 1960. It's not as simple, which I'm not saying this is simple, but saving that old post office pavilion, which actually still struggles a little bit with keeping commercial tenants. But it wasn't, it's not just about that. It's about saving something like the High Line, which is, uh, takes a lot of innovative thinking, or Bertrand Goldberg's uh, Prentice Women's Hospital, which is made of concrete, uh, no, so there are no corners <laughs> in that building, or saving something that is brutalist and making it sustainable. Uh, those, that's all part of that generation, too. And I do think that that is the way that uh, we keep getting younger people in. Uh, they, they say, I want to save what I grew up in. They come in exactly like I did, which is why um, Eventually, if we want younger preservationists to join this movement and feel included, we can't keep going around saying we hate the, you know, those McMansions. Or uh, I remember when an organization was on a roll saying, you know, that uh, all that fast food stuff is not significant and shouldn't be safe. Well, eventually that McDonald's thing came up, but what it really alienated people like myself who grew up with that and actually sort of wiped those old buildings and wanted to save them. So it's, we had to be careful not to alienate these young ladies. Yeah, you, you brought Does up an have any questions? Yeah, I, I don't see any coming in at this mm -hmm. moment, but um, anybody is welcome to okay. unmute themselves and ask questions um, or type it in the chat box. Um, and I, maybe I'll follow up with a question because you, you talked a, quite a bit about brutalism. And um, mm -hmm. you sort of alluded to maybe some of the challenges on, on a sustainability sort of front and um, also the opportunities on, on drawing people who come from a generation that grew up with brutalism. Um, and I, you know, I, uh, I, my grad school education was at UMass Amherst, which is uh, sort of like a mecca for brutalism. And um, I, I got very mixed responses from people. You, you either really hate brutalism or you really, really love it. And I'm wondering how you can maybe get people to at least appreciate it or, uh, or, or at least understand that, uh, that's, that it's important to save and especially convince them um, about uh, sustainability and how to make um, brutalist buildings uh, part of um, an environmental sort of effort, you know. Right. Well, you have to be more creative, definitely. So brutalism, I wasn't even c totally convinced. Uh, so I had to do the same thing, which is ask people to take me around their brutalist, uh, favorite brutalist buildings and explain why the building was important and show some of the details. And since then, I've done quite a bit of research on it. And it's really, uh, it's the same, it is based on generational uh, quite a bit. So. Uh, there's a big movement in Boston to save brutalism. There's, I believe, Toronto. There's a big movement in Australia. There, and then also in the UK, huge numbers of concrete uh, fans. They love concrete. They want to save concrete. They will come up with interesting new ideas. Uh, Boston, or that Boston City Hall is one. 
if you look up ugliest building in the world, which I love doing this on Google, I recommend it. Look up ugliest building in the world, and you'll see all kinds of interesting stuff. And one that always comes up at the top is the Boston City Hall, uh, which has its issues, definitely. But I think if people would say, I don't like that building, and it just doesn't work, so we're going to scrap everything and start over, which is definitely not the right idea. And in a place like Boston, you know, the whole appeal of it is to have the layers of history, all of the layers, not so, you know, not layered from the 17th century through 1940, and then we skip 60 years, and then we get another layer. Uh, that's not really conducive to creating this depth of community. But I think people actually enjoy, and I do think they seek it out. Um, so that takes some, some innovation, definitely. Uh, the pluralism, what I like to do is what, what they, was recommended, is you actually need to get very, very close to the concrete and start examining the architecture as almost a, uh, the concrete is almost a living thing and look for variations in the formwork. You'll see splinters actually still in the concrete and it can be really um, tactile, very interesting, but you have to really get into it. Um. Great. Uh, I, I don't see any questions coming in, and maybe uh, okay. if, if there aren't any further ones, I'll ask one final question that sort of came up on my mind when I was um, listening to your presentation. And um, that, uh, you know, you talked about creative reuse proposals and sort of also talked about the challenges of uh, the commercial architecture of the post sort of World War II era, um, uh, whether they were drive ins or malls. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of these places, uh, they've sort of, you, you feel, or at least there's the sense that they've, lo they've outlived a useful life as they were originally intended to be used, and um, trying to figure out mm -hmm. creative reuse proposals for structures like that is, is a challenge. Do you know of any um, examples, or uh, I, um, you mentioned the High Line, which is a great example of, of a reuse of an early, I guess it would be a late 19th, early 20th century um, uh, sort mm -hmm. of structure. But is, is there any great examples of either a reuse of a drive-in or an or, um, uh, indoor mall that you could point to? Right. Well, that's, yeah, well, that's the problem with drive-ins. There's not really that much there. It's a big screen, and the most significant part is usually the sign that's outside of the drive-in or on the back of the screen, and then it's just a series of big of lumps. Uh, so um, there is, uh, that's, the, that's probably the toughest thing to say as a lot of people use them as flea markets. But, and, but they're actually coming back. And so what I've found is that younger people are saying, isn't that so much fun, this idea that you would go see a movie in your car, and they actually use these pop-up screens now, and people have these sort of pop-up drive-ins. So the idea is coming back. The key is to, if we have any of the original left. Uh, motels are very difficult to save, probably one of the hardest uh, things to save, because so it's a whole long series of little tiny rooms. The most successful thing I've seen so far is a church bought a motel, a two-story but open motel that has like a pool in the middle. Uh, they're using it as an artist uh, residency and studio. So the artist can live there and then have their studio there. And then they open that up to the community, and it's been very, that's here in Orlando. And it's actually been really popular to use. The other thing that motels can be used for, which is a community use, is uh, low-income housing, uh, because uh, a lot of them are used for low-income housing anyway, but um, not in the sense that it's fair to the occupant. So by actually converting some of these old motels into of low income housing that works really well. Great, thank you. And it, it appears somebody is typing in a question now and it just popped up. You can probably see it on the screen. Uh, can you provide any examples of partnerships with non preservation organizations that have been successful? Well yeah, definitely. Uh, a lot of our uh, with the Cape and House I can use this example. Uh, we partnered with Orange County. Uh, we, we got a, a very uh, generous grant from them. It was based on tourist taxes. We've also approached um, a foundation 
and preservation is not their usual um, avenue. I would say you can definitely partner with a city, uh, with city and government organizations. It takes a little more work. Uh, and then also the community is, is going to be your biggest asset in, in, in any case. So when I'm fighting for a building and I don't live in that state and I don't belong to that community, it's actually very difficult uh, because they can immediately say, well, you don't live here. What do you know about this building? But what I always try to do is get the community involved and get people to go to city council. And those are the people that can convince the, the public. Um, the critical partnership that I forgot to mention is the media. So I will maintain a, a number of media relationships local, like the newspaper. Still, and people still read it, even if they do it online. The newspaper, uh, even if it's the bloggers. I went to an event in St. Louis, and they invited bloggers. It was a blogger's breakfast. And the bloggers came, and then they wrote about it. And then all of their people then knew about it, and we can get out a lot further that way. So I would say those partnerships are critical uh, to outreach. Uh, funding partnerships, you have to be a little creative. But it, it does work. Right. Yeah, that's a very and good point. Had a question. Um, yeah. No, I was going to say that's a very good point. I, uh, I, uh, in my own personal experience, just noticing that um, fans of modernism tend to be much more media savvy and and um, use uh, online media quite a bit more than. Uh, I don't see a lot of Victorian blogs out there, but I see a lot of modernism, modernism blogs. Mm -hmm. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a powerful. I think it could be a powerful force um, for for people advocating mm -hmm. advocating for modernism. Um, it does look like there's a second and question. Possibly. Blog. Oh yeah, modernism okay. bloggers. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. and I don't see any further questions. Um, of course, if anybody okay. has any questions that comes up, I'm more than happy to forward them to Christine or um, I can mm -hmm. uh, send you her contact information if that's okay. Um, if, um, yeah. if that's it, then I will uh, close the session by uh, sending everybody to the evaluation um, page. Uh, and here is the evaluation mm -hmm. page. Um, there's also a number of links at the top of the page uh, that you might find helpful, as well as the handout and sign-in sheet for this particular session. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that next week we have our um, somebody raise their hand, so maybe they have a question. So if if you'll humor me for a second, uh, I'll unmute the person who is raising their hand. And, okay, so you, uh, Talon um, is unmuted, and if you had a question, you're more than welcome to speak up now. Yes, we have a big group here, and we do have a question. The, uh, the question is, how does the impact of asbestos and other health-threatening materials used in the construction of these buildings get addressed in the movement towards preserving brutalism architecture? Uh, sure, I can answer that. Materials is not my area as much, so if I have a materials um, issue, I usually bring in an expert on materials. Uh, I'm more of a public advocate and the building advocate, but I, there are ways to deal with this. Um, there are some, I admit, there are a few buildings that perhaps the mitigation for hazardous materials outweighs uh, the value of preserving the structure. But I think there's very few uh, where we can't come up with some reasonable idea or method to, um, to isolate you know, some of these components Asbestos, as you know, is only hazardous when it's disturbed. Uh, so if you have a building that has asbestos, you can um, change renovation plans, perhaps, to not disturb it. You can encapsulate it. Uh, if you have an asbestos flooring, you can put new flooring over it that doesn't penetrate, to my understanding. And um, there are some, uh, I think, more often than not, it's used as a lever to encourage demolition. I did read about one library where the city said uh, that the building just didn't have adequate wiring, and so they were going to consider demolition. Um, I think that in other buildings I've heard, well, it just has too much asbestos, so we just can't save it. 
And then you say, well, have you done an asbestos examination? And a lot of times they'll say, well, we sort of did. And you'll say, did you have a mitigation plan? They'll be like, well, we didn't want to do that because we didn't think it was worth it. So I think it's important if somebody does bring that up to really follow through and say, well, how much is it going to cost? What is the real plan for that? And why do you think that this is insurmountable? Uh, even if you demolish the building, you still have to do that. That kind of mitigation is problem. So it's not any easier to demolish the building than to uh, rehab it in that case, I think. Great. And um, is there a follow-up question to that, or should we move on to the evaluation? Okay. It appears uh, we're going to move on to the evaluation now. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there's a handout and sign-in sheet at the top of the screen, as well as additional links. Um, on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a feedback form. Um, please uh, fill this out, one through nine, and scroll back up to the top of the page and hit Submit Response. Um, that helps CPF improve our programs um, and uh, learn from what your feedback is and hopefully provide additional sessions that you're interested in. Um, especially on the two right pods, you'll see uh, short answer responses. That's where you can tell us exactly what you're looking for in a program. And uh, chances are it'll become, in our, uh, become part of our 2015 calendar of educational events. And I finally wanted to thank Christine um, for your wonderful presentation today. And uh, also hope that everybody has a great rest of the day. And also join us for the final part of the Modernism series, which is a, a free program for members of CPF. Um, I think this is our second free program of the year. And all you have to do is register online. Um, this program will cover the movement of the La Concha Motel lobby uh, to the Las Vegas Neon Museum. And it will uh, consist of a panel of about five speakers. So visit news.californiapreservation.org slash events if you'd like to register. And I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. What I'll do is leave the screen up so you can leave your responses. And thanks again, everybody. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.